Hi guys, happy Monday. How's everybody feeling today? Got a case of the Mondays. <laughs> Office Space, anyone? Office Space? It's a great movie. You gotta see Office Space. Um, all right, welcome back. Hopefully that weekend wasn't uh, too short. Seemed a little short to me. Um, but we had a good time. We went down to Comic-Con and walked around a bit. Did, did anybody go down to Comic-Con? Yeah, it was kind of, I, we didn't go into the convention center. We just walked around near the convention center and lots of interesting characters down there. Yeah, fun place. My boy is like three and a half, so he was walking around in an outfit because that's what you do, right? When you're three and a half or 35 or however old you want to be. But he had a Superman hat on, he had a Batman shirt on, and he had a cape that said Shooter Man. So he was looking good and confusing everybody. So. All right, we uh, have actually quite a bit to cover. Uh, today, and we in fact might not finish up this chapter today. Uh, we might work on it a little bit more tomorrow. So uh, the first thing that you might notice is that the homework that was due tonight is no longer due tonight. It is due tomorrow night. Okay, I see a, a sigh of relief over there. Several people just looked up to the heavens. So that's good. Um, so let's get going on this. We'll talk for about 45 minutes, we'll take a break, and then we'll talk for another uh, three or four hours, okay? So just get comfortable and let's have a discussion. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about this idea of flux, okay? Magnetic flux through a surface. And let's ask, uh, let's ask this question. Let's say I have lines of B that are pointing to the right. And now I have a surface like that, okay? So it's a plane parallel surface that is perpendicular to those lines of B. And we want to ask, what is the flux through that surface? And remember, flux is lines of B through a surface. All right, well, here comes one line goes through the surface. Here comes another line, goes through the surface. Here comes another line, and it goes through the surface. And so we would say, what's the flux? It's three. Okay, and we know that it's B times the area A, but whatever units you end up with, we can just say that is three. Three lines of B are going through that area. But now let's do the following. Let's say we're going to take our lines of B still pointing to the right, okay, but we are going to tip the area sideways. Okay, so this is supposed to represent a vertical plane, but now it is a horizontal plane. And it's still area A. What is the flux in this case? What do you guys think, sitting here in my studio audience? What's the flux through this surface? Zero. Zero, right? The top line skims right on past. The middle line skims right on past. The bottom line skims right on past. None of them actually go through this infinitely thin surface. And so the flux is zero. Okay. So there is some relationship between B and the area which is important. And let's look at the intermediate case. So let's say my lines of B are pointing to the right. And now I'm going to draw this area, but it's tilted. Okay, and this is the surface normal to the area. And hat, and let's say that this thing is tilted down at an angle theta relative to the horizontal. It's still area A, but now what is the flux? It's not the full three, it's not zero, it's something in between, okay? And so flux, in this case, remember we write flux with a capital phi, is the following. It's B times the area 
times the cosine of that angle theta. Okay? When theta is zero, you're back to this case. Okay? And therefore the flux, three, is just B times A times the cosine of zero degrees, which is just B times A. In this case, it would be B times A times the cosine of what? Well, the surface normal would be pointing up. And so the angle between B and the surface normal is 90 degrees. And we know that 90 degrees, when you take the cosine of it, you get zero. And so for some angle in between, like we have here, it's just B times A times cosine of that angle, all right? Cosine of theta. All right, so let's try this for um, an example. And let's try the following situation. So let's say we draw an XYZ coordinate system, right-handed XYZ. And now let's have our B field pointing up at an angle of 35 degrees. And this is in the YZ plane. Okay, so it's in the plane of the glass here. And now let's draw two different areas. Let's draw this one. Okay, and we will call this one area A, XZ, because it's in the XZ plane. And then we'll draw this one. And that's area A, XY, because it's in the XY plane. Okay. And we want to find the flux through the XZ plane. And we want, to fly, we want to find the flux through that XY area. OK. How do we do this? Well, we go back to our definition, right? Flux is going to be B times A times the cosine of the angle between the two, all right? So for phi x z, what do we have? Well, we've got b, we have some area a, and we're going to say that both these areas are equal, so a x z is equal to AXY, and we're just going to call that capital A. And now we have the angle between this area and this B field. Okay, and now we have to be a little bit careful, right? Because the area has a surface normal to it, and that's the relevant angle here. So the surface normal to AXZ is in fact directly to the right. Let me make a little space here. It is directly to the right. Okay. That is the normal to that surface. So if that's pointing in the y-axis and B is pointing up in this direction, what is the angle between those two? Well, the other angle is 35, so this one has to be 90 minus 35. 90 minus 35 is 55. So this is 55 degrees. So that's the relevant number that you want to put right there. B times A times the cosine of 55 degrees. What about uh, the other one, phi x, y? 
Well, AXY is pointing straight up, right? That's the normal to it. And so that is along the Z, and we already know that the angle between Z and B is 35 degrees. So that one becomes B times A times the cosine of 35 degrees. Okay, so this is how you attack flux problems when you're dealing with B fields in areas that are not necessarily at right angles to each other or parallel to each other. It's somewhere in between the two. If you guys have questions as we go, just shout them out. It's going to be a little hard for me to see your hand, but... And what was your name again over here? D. D is monitoring the uh, chat room online. Hopefully for this class, not some other chat room. So if you have questions out there at home, fire them up. Hi. I should just have a, a whole bunch of like stick on things, right? So I could just do my little emoticon right there. Hi. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's go back to um, let's go back to Faraday's law for a second. Okay. The reason that you care about flux is because when you have a current loop, when you have a loop that can generate current in it, it depends on how much flux is going through it, but it also depends on how quickly that happens. So Faraday's law tells us. that the EMF generated, remember EMF is like a voltage, it's an electromotive force. It's how hard is that thing going to get pushed, those charges, how hard are they going to get pushed? It is negative delta phi over delta T. Okay, so this is kind of cool because if I just take a B field and I just have it pointed in one direction, and now I take a current loop and I spin it at some frequency omega. What happens in this loop? Okay. What happens is when it's facing one way, there is current generated one way. And when it flips around and goes the other way, there is current generated the other way. And so this will actually generate an AC current in this little loop. Okay, current's going to go one way, and then later on it's going to switch and go back the other way, and it will keep sloshing back and forth between those two. And we can understand that from this idea of flux. Flux was positive in one direction, and then the loop flipped around, and so now it was negative. And then it keeps going, it flips back to positive, and so forth. But let's say we do this with more than one loop. I don't want just one coil, I want a whole bunch of coils. In that case, we just add up the EMF, which is kind of like adding up the voltages. You throw an N in there to tell you that you're going to get N times the EMF that you would have with just one coil. Okay, so if we have a whole coil here. Let's see if we can draw this. Okay, there's a whole stack of coils. And now as it rotates in this B field, it's going to generate an AC current. And we know that it's going to generate it sinusoidally because it's rotating around at omega. All right, so let's take a look at an example problem of this, okay? Okay, so we're going to start 
um, with our coil pointing down and our B field pointing to the right. Okay, and this is our coil right here, and there's a few different loops on it. And it's pointing down, so we have our surface normal N hat pointing down. And let's give you the following information. When we start this experiment at t equals zero, this angle is, of course, 90 degrees. But this thing is going to rotate into a new position. And at some later time, it's sitting right here. Okay. N hat is now in this direction, and this angle between those two is theta 1, and theta 1 equals 45 degrees, and it does this at a time, T1 of a hundredth of a second. Okay, so this thing is rotating pretty quickly. It rotates into this position in a hundredth of a second. And let's give you a little bit more information. The number of turns on this coil is 950. Uh, the coil has a radius. So this is information about the coil. The radius of the coil R is 6 centimeters. So 0 0.06 meters. And let's also tell you that the EMF generated is 0 0.065 volts. Okay, and this is all the information that we're given. And let's say that we are looking for B. What is the strength of the B field that's going to generate these results? Okay, so we go back to our definition for EMF. Okay, let's make a little room. So the EMF, we said, was negative N delta phi over delta T. All right, and we're only really worried about the magnitude here, so we'll just put some magnitude bars on it, not worry about the negative sign. It's delta phi over delta T. But what is delta phi? Well, Phi, we said, was B times A times the cosine of theta. So a delta phi is just going to be phi in the first case, which is B times A times cosine of some theta 1. And then we're going to subtract phi naught. Okay, so this is B times A times cosine of, we just called it theta. That's what we get on the top. On the bottom, we have delta T. And now we have some common factors, and so we can factor out some stuff. We've got N times B times A. We have the cosine of theta 1, the cosine of theta. And we're all dividing this by delta T. And so now we can solve this thing for B. What do we get? Well, I've got to multiply across by delta T. So I get EMF epsilon times delta T. And then I have to divide by N, divide by A, and divide by cosine theta 1 minus cosine of theta. And now we should have just about all those numbers, except it's a circular loop, right? So we need to put in for the area A. So this is pi r squared for our area A. Cosine theta 1 minus cosine of theta. OK, and now we can solve this.
All right, so we've got B equals. Epsilon, we said, was 0 0.065 volts. Delta T was 0 0.01 seconds. Down on the bottom, we've got N, which we said was 950. We've got pi, which is pi. We've got R, which is 0 0.06 squared. And then we have cosine of theta 1, which we said was 45 degrees. Theta was 0 degrees. Okay. And if somebody punches in this stuff into your calculator, tell me what you get. So we've got 6.5 times 10 to the minus 2. We've got another 10 to the minus 2 right there. We've got 950. We've got a pi. We've got 6 times 10 to the minus 2 squared. Cosine of 45 is 1 over root 2. Cosine of 0 is what? Yeah. Oh, was it? Okay. Let's sneak in a 9 right there. Cosine of 90. Okay, good. Yeah, that's right, because the surface normal is pointing down. Yeah, thank you. So cosine of 90, we know that cosine of 90 is 0. Okay, so this is what we end up with. And let's approximate it here while you guys punch it into your calculator. So we've got 6.5 times 10 to the minus 4 up top. We've got 9.5 times 10 to the 2. We've got a pi. We have 36 times 10 to the minus 4. And then we have a 1 over root 2. And let's see what this becomes. 10 to the minus 4 drops out with that. Uh, we've got 6.5 over this stuff, which is 9.5 times pi times 36. This is a lot of numbers here, but let's, let's keep going. We're going to say this is 10. So this becomes a 10 to the 3. And then we've got pi times 36. That's got to be really close to 100. Right, so that's 10 to the 3 times the 10 to the 2, so that's a 10 to the 5. And then we got a 1 over root 2. And that's the same as multiplying by square root of 2 up at the top, which has to be really close to 10 up in the top. And so I'm going to say my guess is 10 to the minus 4. That's what I'm guessing. Anybody punch it into your calculator and get an answer? Eight point five six times ten to the negative five. Good. So that was a decent guess, right? Because ten times ten to the negative five would be ten to the minus four. Okay. So that is the strength of the B field. What are the units on B field? Tesla, right? So we put a capital T right there. Okay. Questions about that one. Okay. Dave, how you doing? You have a good weekend? Oh, a great weekend. Did you go down to Comic-Con? No, no, I enjoyed gardening in the rain. <laughs> we uh, checked out the, there was a truck down there from the movie Into the Storm. Oh, yeah. And uh, my kid was looking at this truck and saying, wow, what does that do? What does that do? What does that do? And the lady was giving him the whole spiel. And then finally, she leans over and she goes, it's not real. It's a fake truck for a fake storm. <laughs> and he was like, oh, <laughs> he's so bummed. I said, yeah, I got a car that goes into the storm, but it's in San Diego. It goes into the light breeze. <laughs> OK, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, Lenz's law for a second. We introduced this 
last time, but let's just review what Lenz's law says. Lenz's law is solely for determining the direction of the current. Okay, Faraday's, Faraday's law tells us about the EMF, the voltage that develops, okay, but Lenz's law tells us which way that current's going to get pushed. And it's very simple, right? We said nature abhors a change in flux. Nature abhors a change in flux. So, let's say I do the following. Let's say I have a magnet that is approaching a current loop, like so, north and south. Okay. And we want to figure out what direction the current is going to go. Well, the magnetic field is pointing up out of this thing. Okay, so the magnetic field from the bar magnet is up, and we know it's spreading out, and some of it is poking through our loop. Like so. So the flux is increasing in that loop. And it doesn't like that. It doesn't like an increase in flux. And so it wants to make a B field that is going to point down. Okay? The loop wants to generate a current such that the B field is pointing down, which means it's going to develop in this direction. If I use my right hand rule, what I said was if you put your fingers in the direction of the current, then your thumb will be the direction of the B field. So for this one, we've got a B field that is going down because the current loop is coming around like this, right? This is the direction of the current. And so the B field is, in fact, pointing down. Okay, and this is B due to the loop. Okay, I, I drew it without the magnet here for simplicity. But the idea is that nature abhors a change in flux. And so if flux is increasing from some other source, it's going to do whatever it can to make it decrease. Okay. So, what happens now if instead of doing something like this, we just take our loop and we move it through a region of magnetic field? So let's do the following. We're going to draw a region of magnetic field here, B where it's everywhere pointing out of the page, okay? When it's pointing out of the screen and we take a ring and we start to move it through something's going to happen. There's going to be current that develops in the ring. Now, before it gets to the magnetic field region, What's the current in the ring? No current, right? Current zero. Okay. When it is in the center of this region, and it's still moving to the right, what is the current in the ring? What do you guys think? What is it 90% of the time when I ask you? Zero. zero. The current's zero. Why? Because the flux is not changing in this region. It's moving through a constant magnetic field, a uniform magnetic field. So the only time something interesting happens is right here where it crosses and right here where it crosses. Okay. And when it crosses there, and it crosses there, the current is no longer zero. 
and now we have to think about the flux, okay? So the flux is out of the page, which means that the ring wants to make a current that is going into the page, right? And this helps if you look over there at the computer monitor instead of looking at me. Okay, so B is coming out of the screen. But my ring wants to make something, wants to make a field that's going into the screen. Okay, so how does it do that? It does it like this. If you take your right hand and you put your fingers in the direction of the current, right, I'm gonna wrap my fingers around in the direction of the current, my thumb is telling me that that will make a B field going into the screen. Okay, so current's gonna develop in the ring in that direction. And now you know exactly what's going to happen on this side. The exact opposite is going to happen. So over here, current in fact generates, is generated in that direction. Because the B field that it was in is decreasing. The B field coming out of the screen is decreasing, but it wants to keep that going. It doesn't want the change. And so by putting a B field in this direction, take your right hand, wrap your fingers around, now we got our thumb coming out of the screen. Okay, and so it's making a current in that direction. And then finally, when it gets back out here, and it's still moving along at V, then current goes back to zero. So the only time current develops is at these boundaries. Anywhere it's uniform or zero, then there is no current that develops in the loop. Okay, any questions about that? Did I get the right hand rule right? Did everybody agree with what I was doing? Okay, I wrapping around this way gives me a B that's pointing into the screen. I wrapping around this way gives me a B that's pointing out of the screen. Okay, let's say we do the following experiment. Let's take a big bar magnet. Okay, bar magnet has a north and a south pole. And now let's take a uh, voltage source here. And let's make a little solenoid right here. And let's run some wires around this solenoid. And eventually coming back to our voltage source. Right. So, if I run current through this thing, it's going to create a magnetic field. If the north pole of that magnetic field is facing this north pole, they're going to get pushed apart. If the south pole of that magnetic field that I generate is facing the north pole, they're going to get pulled together. And so if I alternate it, right, if I have a voltage source here that is oscillating, what's going to happen to this solenoid? It's going to go up, and it's going to go down, it's going to go up, and then it's going to go down. Okay. And if I attach that to a big cone and I turn this thing on, what have I just produced? What is this device? Anybody? This is a speaker, okay? This is your speaker or loudspeaker, however you like to say it. 
Okay. This is your speaker cone in your stereo. If you open up that front cover, you can see the cone. There's usually a sort of round shape on the inside. And you can look in there and you can see where the wires attach to the cone. And then on the back side, there's a very powerful magnet. And you know this because if you take the speaker cone out and you stick it up on the fridge, it just sticks it, right? That magnet is very powerful. So when I run current through this thing, back and forth, it flips the direction of the B field in this solenoid back and forth, and the cone goes up and down, and it emits sound waves. Okay, so this is exactly how your speaker works. But let's say we reverse the process. Let's say we do the whole thing again. Okay, here's our solenoid. Anybody try my solenoid joke on your TAs? No? Try it, it's good for a hearty chuckle. How's your lab going? I'm so annoyed. Let's say we do it again, but we're not going to drive the circuit, okay? We are actually going to blast it with sound waves coming in. Okay, instead of sound waves going out, we're going to blast it with sound waves coming in. If the sound wave hits this speaker cone, what happens? It pushes the speaker cone up and down, just a little bit. Okay. Just like this one over here. And if that speaker cone gets pushed up and down a little bit, this coil is now closer or further from the magnetic field due to this bar magnet. And if there is a changing flux through the coil, then there is an EMF that is generated here. And so let's not label this V, let's label this EMF epsilon. Okay, and we know what that is. EMF epsilon is negative N delta phi over delta T. So now if you put a device here that can measure that EMF, that voltage, all of a sudden you can in fact record sound waves. Anybody know what this device is called? What have we created here? Maybe not the most efficient creation, but this is a microphone. Okay. But wait a minute, I just drew the exact same pictures, right? Am I saying that you could use this thing as a speaker, but you could also use it as a microphone? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. And that's kind of weird to think about, right? But if you just grab hold of your speaker, and you start yelling into your speaker, and you measure the voltage coming out, it will mimic your sound waves going in, okay? It's not gonna be the best, right? Real microphones, like the lapel mic that I'm wearing right here, are designed differently, but the idea is exactly the same. If you turn sound waves into voltages, it's a microphone. If you turn voltages into sound waves, it's a speaker. It's all the same reversible physics, which I think is pretty cool. So when you're stuck out there in the wilderness, you don't have a Microphone, just grab your speaker. It'll work. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you guys hear me now? Okay, good. Yeah. Um, Sarah asked a question about a couple of the, uh, uh, the misconceptual questions on the homework, so let's take a look at a couple of those. Um, and the first one says, a loop rests in the plane of a page of a textbook while a magnetic field is directed into the page. A clockwise current is induced. Check all that apply. Okay. So we got to figure out when the clockwise current is induced. And 
let's see if we can draw the picture. So this is related to what we just talked about a second ago. Uh, a loop rests in the, in the plane of a page of a textbook while a magnetic field is directed into the page. So B is everywhere going into the page, or if you look at the computer monitor, it's into the screen. And it says that a clockwise current is induced. Okay, so clockwise current means it's going around like that. All right, clockwise current going around like that in the loop will generate a B field in the loop that is pointing out towards you, right? Take your right hand and put it in the direction of the current. Let's see if we did this right. Mm, I think I got it wrong. I think it's going into the screen, right? Because I put my fingers around in the direction of the current and my thumb is coming back into the computer monitor, okay? So, how would it possibly do that? The way it would do that is if this B field was getting weaker, then it would try to keep the B field in the same direction. So one of the options is when the magnetic field gets stronger. That doesn't sound right, okay? One of the options is when the loop is moved sideways across the page, Maybe, let's come back to that one in a second. It says, when the magnetic field is tilted, so it is no longer perpendicular to the page. So if I took this whole B field that was pointing into the page, and suddenly I pointed it parallel to the screen, then the flux would drop in that loop, and it would therefore make a B field that would try to keep the flux going in the same direction. So that one sounds good, all right? I'm gonna click that one. The other one, the last one says, when the size of the loop decreases, right? Remember, flux is equal to B times A times the cosine of the angle. So if the area decreases, then the flux through it is starting to decrease. It doesn't like that, and so it's gonna make a B field that is stronger to compensate for it, and it would do it in this particular direction. So I like that one as well. So I have two answers right now, and let's go back to the first one. It says, when the loop is moved sideways across the page. So if I move this loop in this uniform B field, is that gonna generate a current? No, right? It's only when you get to the edge of the page that it would generate a current. So when it crosses this edge or it crosses that edge, then it will generate a current. But if it's moving all in the page in the uniform B field, then there won't be a current. So I would say that there are two answers. I would say that when the B field is tilted, That sounds like a good one to me. And I would say when the area decreases. So I'm gonna answer those two and click in and see if I got it right. And it says correct. Hey, cool. Okay, questions about that one? Yeah. Yeah, so when you have um, current in a loop, you can do this. If you curl your fingers, that's in the direction of I, and then your thumb will tell you the direction of B. This is a caveat to the right-hand rule that we talked about last time, okay, an alternative form of the right-hand rule. So if I curl my fingers around in the direction of the current, then my thumb is going into the screen, okay? So if you hold up your right hand and try that, looking at the computer monitor, 
If you hold up your right hand and you curl your fingers around in the direction of the loop, then your thumb should be going into the screen. Okay? Into the screen is drawn with an X. Is that, is that working for everybody? Okay. So the only reason we drew I in this direction is because in the problem they told us that that is the current that's induced in the loop. Okay. They gave us that little bit of information. Okay, any other questions on that one? Yeah? So when you were saying earlier though that the current is zero when it's inside, mm -hmm. is that like in the paper right now it's zero too? It's zero inside if B doesn't change, A doesn't change, or theta doesn't change. So the two that they gave us where it did change was this one, B changed. And this one, area changed. Oh, I'm sorry. This first one is not B changing. It's theta changing, right? It's tilted. Theta was changing in that one. Okay. So if it's moving across in a uniform B, and the area of the loop doesn't change, and the B field doesn't change, and nothing is tilted, then there's no current that develops. But if something here changes, then there is a current that develops. Okay? Did that answer your question? <laughs> okay. Yeah? So when you're moving the loop from one end through and to the other end, mm -hmm. when it reaches the border, is the B changing? Uh, so what this square area represents is a uniform B there and then outside B equals zero. Yeah, so certainly if you move this loop all the way to the edge, then B would be changing, okay? And so you would develop a current. Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at the next misconceptual. Okay, so the next one, uh, it has a little figure, and let's draw it right here. We've got a ring, and then there is B field, which is pointing out of this ring. Okay, and it says the following. A non-conducting plastic hoop is held in a magnetic field that points out of the figure. As the strength of the field increases, so B field is coming out towards you and it's increasing, we need to figure out what's going to happen to the EMF in this loop. And here are some choices. An induced EMF will be produced that causes a clockwise current. No induced EMF will be produced. An induced EMF will be produced that causes a counterclockwise current. An induced EMF will be produced but no current. Hmm. What do you guys think? Do you like the last one? Why do you like the last one? Okay. EMF is negative delta phi over delta T. And we know what delta phi is, right? It can change B. It could change A, or it can change theta. So is something changing? Yes. They tell us that B increases. So B increasing means that this is non-zero. Okay, so EMF is produced. Now, what we said was EMF being produced means that there will be a current generated in this loop. But you can think of this loop as composed of metal and a resistor. And what they tell us is that it is a non-conducting plastic hoop. So if it's plastic, what is R? 
approximately, or we should say approaching. It's approaching infinity, right? What is the current that develops? I is equal to V over R, which is EMF epsilon over R. The epsilon was not zero, of course, but the resistance is basically infinite. So you do produce an EMF, but you produce no current. I like the last one as well. Let's click that and submit it. And that is indeed correct. Okay. EMF is produced, but no current flows because the resistance is infinite. Sarah, is that okay? All right. Okay, one thing that we just talked about was uh, the following. Let's say that I have a coil, and I'm going to take a bar magnet, and I'm going to push it towards the coil. When I do that, I can generate an epsilon in the coil. Okay, but pushing the bar magnet towards the coil is really like increasing the strength of the magnetic field in the coil. So let's replace the bar magnet with a solenoid. Okay, so let's take a solenoid right here. And we're going to run some current through the solenoid. Okay, and if I run current I through that solenoid, I know what it's going to do. It's going to produce a B field that is pointing up just like the B field was pointing up over there. And if I increase the current going through this thing, I'm going to increase the strength of the B field, and that is also going to generate an EMF in the coil. And in fact, we know what direction it is. If B is increasing going up, then the coil is going to want to oppose that. And so it's going to have a current in the opposite direction. And now, here's the cool thing, right? Let's call this current in the solenoid the primary. And let's call this one the secondary. Okay, but is there any reason that I just need to have one coil there? No, not, not at all. I can do many coils up there. But let's think about the following. Instead of doing that, right, let's do just one coil to simplify everything. So I'm going to make one coil, like so. And it's going to come back around, and we're going to call that our secondary coil. And then down here, I'm going to have a primary coil. Wraps around. And we're going to run current through these things. If I run current, I'm going to intercept some flux. And the amount of flux that I intercept in the secondary depends on how much current I run through the primary. And so this is equal to M times IP. This is IP. There's some current IS, which develops in the top one. How much current depends, how much current in the bottom one dictates how much magnetic field is going to go through the top one. And so you get this factor M in there where M 
is something called the mutual inductance. Okay. And now we're going to go back to this case where we add many turns to it. So in my secondary, if I put many turns, then the amount of flux just increases like n. Okay? So with n s turns, Then the flux goes like n, but that is still just equal to m times ip. Okay? And so you can write down what m is. m is equal to n sub s, phi sub s, divided by i sub p. Okay, but Faraday told us that if you're intercepting flux and it's changing in time, then you develop an EMF. The EMF, we said, was minus N delta phi over delta T. And so in the secondary, the EMF which develops is minus N sub S delta phi sub S over delta T. But we know what N sub S phi sub S is. And so this becomes minus delta m i sub p divided by delta t. And we get an equation for the EMF in the secondary. It is minus m change in the primary current, delta IP, divided by delta T. Okay, so coils can in fact talk to each other. Run current through the low, lower coil, there is current that is generated in the upper coil. How much? Well, this is the EMF that defines it. So there's something else very interesting going on here, though. And this is something called self-inductance. If I take a coil, and okay, let's just do one loop for simplicity. Here's my coil and I run some current through it, I. I know that I generate a B field. Okay. But the coil itself says, wait a minute, there's a B field being generated. That is changing the flux that I see. And I don't like that. Lenz's law says I should not like a change in flux. And so there is an EMF that is developed to oppose that, okay? So the changing B, the changing B field through itself, through the same coil, produces an EMF. And this is, in fact, what we call the back EMF, because it's trying to oppose that, okay? What is that quantity? Well, the EMF is negative L delta I over delta T, where L is something called self-inductance. Okay, and so here's the catch. Any coil is an inductor. Inductors are something that you've probably played around with already in the lab. Any coil loop is an inductor. 
meaning if you try to run current through it, it's going to generate a B field. The loop itself doesn't like that changing B field, and so it's going to fight back against you with this back EMF, and this is the strength of that back EMF. So we don't have to do it with just one loop. We can do it with a bunch of loops. And that is our solenoid. Solenoid is just a bunch of loops stacked up on top of each other. Okay. And when I start to drive current through this thing, we know that there is a B field that is produced. But that changing B field says, I don't like that. I don't like that change in flux through the solenoid itself, and it's going to fight back against you. Okay. This thing is an inductor. Okay, we call it a solenoid, but it's also known as an inductor. And it fights against changing current. Okay. It doesn't like it when you change current. So let me give you an example of this sort of thing in action. And this is something that you can all try at home. Okay? And I want you to do the following. I want you to turn on your toaster. Okay? And let it run for a little bit. Turn off all the lights in your house. And I want you to unplug it from the wall. If you do that, what do you observe? Has anybody done this experiment? You might have done this by accident, right? Toaster's running. Instead of turning it off, you walk over to the wall and you unplug it from the wall. What do you see? You see a spark. Okay, it will spark. Why is that? Well, let's think about the toaster. Okay, here's our toaster. And there's some wires that are coming in to the toaster. And then it goes to a wall plug, which has two big metal prongs on it. But inside the toaster, what is there? There's a bunch of heating elements. And those heating elements look like a big coil. So when you run current through this thing, the toaster looks just like an inductor. Okay. And now when you unplug it from the wall, here's the wall socket. When you unplug it from the wall, you in fact see a spark there is a little tiny lightning bolt that goes from the wall to your toaster, to that plug. So don't do this at home if you have a gas leak in your house. <laughs> that would be bad, OK? But if you have a normal house, plug in your toaster for a while, turn off all the lights, and unplug it from the wall real quick, and you should be able to see a spark. So now the question is, why? Why does this happen? Yes? Since there's a change in flux, basically, the coils produce an electromagnetic field going against the current. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I don't know if you guys heard him at home, but that was basically the perfect answer. What he said was there is current 
running from the wall through the toaster. And now there is an electromagnetic field, there's a magnetic field specifically, that develops in this inductor, in those coils in the toaster itself. Okay? And everybody's happy, there's a big strong magnetic field, but then you unplug it from the wall. And suddenly, that magnetic field drops to zero, but the coil doesn't like that. Right? The coil wants to keep it going. And so the coil pushes current through the wires to try and do that, to try and keep that magnetic field going. Inductors fight against changing current. When you unplug it from the wall, you suddenly change the current. And so the inductor is going to fight to keep it going in the same direction. And in fact, so much current is generated that there is a spark between the plug and the wall. The electrons are trying so hard to keep that current going that they jump across that little gap. Okay, and the gap's going to be small. It's going to be like a millimeter or two millimeters. But you will be able to see a little tiny spark in that region, which is kind of cool. And then you can enjoy your toast. So it's, you know, it's a bonus. Okay, is there some energy that we can store in an inductor, right? It's hard to push current through this inductor. That means that we've done some work to do it. There must be some way to store that energy in the inductor itself. Remember when we charged up a capacitor, we of course had energy in that capacitor. How does this work with an inductor? Well, remember, work, W, was equal to QV. Okay, but V is really, in this case, like EMF. Okay, what is the electromotive force that's going to drive these charges around? So, if I think about delta W, how much work do I do by moving a delta Q through the system? It's that. There's a little bit of a technical point. You've got to have a negative sign on there. Okay, don't worry too much about the negative sign. But we know what epsilon is for an inductor, right? It is self-inductance L, which is a value, times delta I over delta T. Okay, L is the value of the inductor and it's measured in henrys so you might have a millihenry inductor look what happens the minus signs cancel out and we get l out in front we get a delta q over a delta t and then we still have a delta i but this is L times delta Q over delta T is I. And then we have a change in I. So when you do this properly with integration, you can figure out what the energy in the inductor is. And it is simply this. 1 half L I squared. This is similar to what we were talking about with capacitors, right? Remember, the capacitor was 1 half CV squared. Similar thing, but now we have 1 half LI squared. But if you're generating energy in this inductor, there really must be energy in those B fields themselves, because the B field in the center of the solenoid, which is really important for the inductor. And so the energy in the B field itself is the following. And we're going to write down the energy density, which is energy per volume. 
and it is 1 over 2 mu naught b squared. Remember, for the electric field, we had 1 half with an epsilon naught times e squared. Now we've got 1 over 2 mu naught times b squared. All right, let's go back to this idea that coils can talk to each other, right? If I run current through one coil, it's going to generate a magnetic field. If I put another coil next to it, I can pick up that magnetic field, generate an EMF in that secondary coil. And let's do it with a particular configuration. And if you do it in this configuration, it's called a transformer. So it looks a little bit like this. You're going to take an iron core. And now you're going to take a coil and wrap it around this side of that iron. And that is our primary coil. And we run IP through it. On the other side, you wrap another wire around. And this develops a current in it, I sub s, and that's our secondary coil. Okay, the purpose of the iron core is to trap the B field lines. So B fields that are generated there end up over there, and B fields that are generated here end up over there. Okay, so it's just a simple way to sort of trap those B field lines. There's another way, which is put the coils right on top of each other or wrap them around on top of each other. But that gets a little confusing when you're looking at it in a picture. So this thing is called a transformer. And let's see if we can write down some properties. There is an EMF in the primary side. And that EMF is the number of turns of the primary coil times delta phi over delta t. There is, of course, an EMF in the secondary coil, which is minus N sub S delta phi over delta T. I can divide by N sub P, and I get epsilon P over N sub P equals minus delta phi over delta T. And I can do the same over here, epsilon S over n sub s equals minus delta phi over delta t. And now here's the thing. The iron core traps the B field lines. So the B fields that are coming through this one end up going through the other one. Okay. And so on either side, you in fact have the same delta phi over delta t on each side. Delta phi over delta t on the left side is exactly the same as delta phi over delta t on the right side because all those B field lines go through and they do it in the same amount of time, delta t. So now this whole thing simplifies to what? Epsilon P over NP equals epsilon S over NS. And this is typically written like this, epsilon S over epsilon P. I had to divide by an epsilon P, and so I got to multiply back up by an N sub S is equal to NS over NP. 
And once you hook this stuff up to a circuit and there is some resistance in it, then these things become voltages. Voltage of S over voltage of P is just N sub S over N sub P. And this thing right here is known as the transformer equation. More than meets the eye. Transformers? Robots in disguise? No? You guys were like five years old or something, right? No? Okay. I guess they're still pretty popular, right? Because they're making like those Transformer movies. But Transformers was like just this little toy, you know, this little robot that turns into a car and back and forth. And it's kind of named appropriately, right? Because what are we doing? We're taking one voltage, V sub S, and we're turning it into a different voltage, V sub P, or vice versa. Typically, you call V sub P the primary. So by putting a voltage on this side of the transformer, I can get a totally different voltage on the other side of the transformer. And all it depends on is how many coils. Now, if I have the same number of coils, then I don't change the voltage. That's called a one-to-one -one transformer. But if I have twice as many loops in the secondary side compared to the primary side, then look what happens. NS is twice NP, and I get twice the voltage on the secondary side that I would get on the primary side. That's called a step-up transformer because you have stepped up the voltage. You come in with one voltage, you go out with a bigger voltage. Okay? The opposite is, of course, true. If I come in with a lot of coils and I go out on this side with fewer coils, say half as many, then it's a step-down transformer. I've taken some high voltage and I've transformed it down to some low voltage. Okay? Step up, increase the voltage. Step down, decrease the voltage. So where do you see these things? Where do you see transformers? On the power lines, right? Okay. On the power lines, you will see transformers. Because the high voltage power lines that are going around are too high for your house. Okay, they're kilovolts. And you obviously don't want kilovolts in your house because then if you accidentally grab hold of that toaster plug while you're pulling it out, right, you can kill yourself. 110 volts, 120 volts RMS, it'll hurt, but it's hard to kill yourself with your household voltage, okay? You'll definitely feel it, but it's really hard to kill yourself. Kilovolts can certainly kill you if there's enough current available. So the voltages that are running around in the power lines are high voltage, and then you want to transform them down to a lower voltage that goes to your house. So you see these things all the time. They're up on the power lines. If you look, there's big cans and things up there on the telephone poles and on the high voltage power lines, those are transformers. Okay, they are transforming the voltage. All right, let's try an example of this, which is very similar to one of your homework problems, which is a toy train problem. Okay, so in this problem it says we have a toy train transformer. And it is a, um, it has a turn ratio of eight to one. And so it looks like this. Here's our iron core. We've got a whole bunch of turns on this side and then we just have a few on this side. Okay, this is our primary, and this is our secondary. So, first off, the way we drew this, is this a step up transformer or a step down transformer? What do you guys think? Down, 
right? We're going down in voltage. Why? Because it's for the toy train and you're going to hand it to your kid and you don't want them running around with 120 volts. You want them running around with, you know, like 12 volts, okay? Something similar to that. So it's a step down transformer. There's lots of coils on this side. There's very few coils on that side. And let's give you the following. We're going to say that the current running through the secondary is 1.6 amps. And we need to find IP. All right. That's probably not too bad, right? What we said was the voltages step up or step down. But voltage is linear with current, thanks to Ohm's law. And so, in fact, current is also going to step up and step down. IS over IP is NP over NS. Okay, and we're looking for IP, so let's just solve this equation for IP. We've got IP is equal to uh, IS times NS over NP. And now we have all these numbers. IS is 1.6 amps. NS is 1. NP is 8. We said it was an 8 to 1 turn ratio. And so we just get 1.6 over 8, which is, of course, 0 0.2 amps. Okay, so that's the first part. And let's think about the second part. And the second part is the question, how much power does the train use? All right. We know that this is coming from the wall, right? So the voltage over here, VP, is 120 volts. This voltage over here is going to be VS. And we know what that is now, right? It's a step down by a factor of 8, so it's 120 over 8. 120 over 8 is 15 volts. So how much power does the train use? Well, the train is on the secondary side. And so PS is just secondary current, which we knew already, times secondary voltage. Okay. And so you can plug this in. You've got 1.6 amps times 15 volts. And if you do 1.6 times 15, what do you get? Hopefully, I'm going to guess 24. Is that right? It's got to be, right? Because this is the same as 16 times 1.5. That's one and a half of 16, which is 24. Okay? So that's how much current is in the secondary. That's how much power is used by the secondary. Okay, questions about transformers?